Hallelujah. Hebrew for praise the Lord. Amen. He is risen. Indeed. Please be seated. Thank you so much, musicians. You are the best. I am so blessed to be working with you this morning. Just marvelous. Thank you again so much. Well, my sense is that probably very few people, if any, have ever come into a worship service at Cornerstone or anywhere else and seen sermon props quite like these. A table with a bottle of wine, 2014 Bordeaux Rosé, a glass, and a pack of cigarettes. This could get me fired. I went to one of the convenience stores yesterday and I said to the little gal there, I said, um, I don't smoke, but I need a pack of cigarettes. I know that unnerves some of you, me mentioning cigarettes. You know, you can, you can be a Christian and still, you can go to heaven if you smoke, you just smell like hell. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> Could you delete that from the, the tape back there? No, and I mean, I went in the store and I said, well, I need a pack of, I don't smoke, but I need a pack of cigarettes, which left a little gal there kind of puzzled. Really? Okay. Why would you want a pack of, don't ask. I just, so sell me a pack of cigarettes. Said, Which one? I don't know. Any of them. The ones that look good, red label or something. So she picked out these and she said, that's $6. I said, I said, one pack. Right. It's $6 for one pack? Six times 10, a carton is 60. Don't take up smoking, people. Well, what's that all about? Uh, the statistics tell us that about 165,000 people die every day on planet Earth. Now, that's interesting. One death in particular last week caught my attention. It took place in Denmark. The man's name is Karsten, and he's been very sickly, and his doctors told him, apparently, just about the beginning of last week, he only had a day or so to live. And his story is on the internet. You can Google it later if you want. But Karsten had a request. This is the part that intrigues me. He said, well, then, would you do something for me? The something is this. I would just like, if I only have a day to live, to sit with my kids, my family, and sit outside and, frankly, have a glass of wine and smoke a cigarette and just be with them. And it of course, at first, the medical people said, no, you're in the hospital. We can't, you can't smoke here and have a glass of wine. But happily, they thought better of it, and they said, well, why not? So there is this marvelous picture circulating on the Internet of this man sitting on the balcony there. He's got a cigarette, and his daughter's handing him a glass of wine. Now, I am not in any manner criticizing him or being disrespectful. I don't know the man. And it's kind of a sweet story if you think about it. I mean, they lightened up and said, sure, let's make that work for you. But here's a question. If your doctor said to you, you have one day to live, what would you do with that day? Linda, Chris, what would you do with that day, Mary? What would you do with that day? Would you go to the theater? Would you go to the ball game? Would you sit on the deck and have a cigarette and a glass of wine? I mean, what would you do with it? And I look at that and think now, as a believer of for 40 years having been born again, I must say, I, I don't mean to judge anyone else what they do with it, but if the doctor said you have 24 hours to live, I would spend that 24 hours clinging to the cross of Jesus Christ. I think of all the martyrs through all the ages who tell the stories of how elated they were, knowing they were dying, and on the day before their death, they felt the Spirit come upon them in a way most extraordinary. What would you do? And if you're here this morning and you're not really ready for that, let me be honest, respectful, but direct with you. This could, after all, be a lot of baloney, this Easter story. I mean, it could be nonsense. It could be just some kind of favorite myth. We could be clinging to something that turns out to be nonsense. But it's not. And that last day question that really matters, what will we do with it? The Apostle Paul wrestled with exactly that question. This isn't new, this question that we ask well, what to do in this modern world. And it shows in the statistics that evangelicalism, they say, at least religiosity, is definitely decreasing in American culture in the last 15 years. I know that. I think it's being thinned out. I think it's being pruned by the Holy Spirit. But that is a propositional statement. What if it's your last day and you don't believe anything? The Apostle Paul quoted the prophet Isaiah, and he said, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we will die, of course. What else would you do? If you thought 
that all you have in this life is this life, and then you die, and then you are dust. Have a glass of wine. Have a cigarette. Do whatever it is you enjoy. Jesus said something very different. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Christian, if you're a Christian this morning, if you've been born in the Spirit, you can't die. I visited so many people in 35 years in hospitals who, who belong to the Lord, and I'd like to say, you know, you can't die. This body's going to die, and it's coming undone. I can see that, and so can you. But you cannot die. And then Jesus turned to Martha and said, so do you believe this? That's the question of the ages. Do you believe this? The Apostle Paul said, actually, he looked forward to dying. What he said was, for me, to live is to live for Christ, but to die would be gain. If I am to go on living in the body, that will mean fruitful labor for me, yet I don't know what to choose. I don't know. I'm torn between these two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. If I'm told I only have a day to live, I'll get the kids all around me, and then my beloved wife of so many years, and we'll sit on the deck somewhere, but we're going to be holding something like this. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel that takes us beyond a final glass of wine, uh, one more cigarette, and then dust. We thank you for the gospel that lifts us up way beyond that. We pray for the person here this morning who's here because it's Easter, they, they, they want to be here. We're glad they came. We pray for your spirit to move upon this place. We've been celebrating the risen Christ. We pray for hearts to be convicted and opened up wide. We pray for me. When I say something not helpful in your sight, I'm sure I will. That you would bring it to nothing and quickly. We commit this time to you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Pastor Larson. Pastor's message today is entitled, Resurrection is taken from the text of John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Please stand for the reading of the Lord. John chapter 20, starting at verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated.
Perhaps you remember that song from the 60s, maybe it was the early 70s. Is that all there is? You remember that? Is that all there is, my friend? I can sing. Let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball. Is that all there is? These people that day at the tomb, you know what they're saying? Is that all there is? This is it? We've been hanging around with Jesus for three years. Friday came and went. We went through Friday afternoon. It was horrible. Friday night was worse. All day Saturday, we're wondering what happened. Now it's Sunday morning, the first day of the week, and they arrived there, and they still didn't understand from the scripture what had happened and that Jesus had to rise from the dead. We have a lot of characters in this story. We have Mary and probably another Mary with her. The New Testament's loaded with Marys. And we have Peter and we have John who wrote this account, never says his own name, and maybe even a couple of others. And the things they have in common are they're desperately disappointed. They can't believe what's happened. They're discouraged. They're totally puzzled. And they share one other thing. Not one of them is thinking there's been a resurrection. They went to the tomb they went to the tomb just for one reason, to tend to the body in case it wasn't adequately prepared. They weren't sure what would come of it, but they felt a need to go there, and it was good that they did. But is that all there is? A dead Christ? You know, that line, he had to rise from the dead, why? Because the things that Jesus said were meaningless unless they were validated by his victory over death. He had to go upon the cross and pay for my sins and yours. That time when you were filled with lust or anger, the time when you were filled with hatred and unforgiveness, when you cheated on this and that, when you exalted yourself when I did and I did worse, that's why he went to the cross. And he had to rise from the dead to prove that he was the perfect sacrifice for those things. It had to happen. And he also had to rise from the dead to prove that resurrection is possible. Well, someone will say, well, pastor, that makes no sense because Jesus himself had done some resurrections. He raised up Lazarus and he raised up others. What do you mean? Yes, but he raised them to die again. All those that he raised came back to life in this flesh only to die again at some point. His resurrection was a resurrection to perfect incorruptibility with a changed body that could never die again. And that's what he's promising to us. And so they're wondering, what happened? The Apostle Paul and others later untangled it all, and so did they. But here is the question. The doctor says you have one day to live. What do you want to do with your last day? Have you wrestled with this question? Do you believe in the resurrection? Would you say to me, the resurrection of Jesus, would you say to me, I'm not sure I believe it, but what's the difference? Here's the difference. Because if one person can be raised from the dead, we all can be raised from the dead. I'm a reader of history, I've said that many times, and I've recently reread the account of the Wright brothers. So go back with me, December 17, 1903. These two men from Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright, they're a couple of engineers and mechanics, two very bright guys, and they've been theorizing that man can fly. Not just go up in a balloon, that's not flying, that's bouncing around and hoping the wind doesn't outdo you actually fly and control your flight, plan it from takeoff to landing. And so they spent several years theorizing, and they build this plane, and it's a modest endeavor indeed, and they go from Ohio down to Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. I know that's a miserable picture, but it's the best one out there I could find. And they place this small primitive plane there, and they take Orville, and he climbs onto it. It's not like you get in it and fasten your seatbelt and watch the flight attendant. No, you just get on this thing, you kind of lie down on it, and you get strapped in. Not exactly a 747 lifting off a metro to head to Amsterdam at 40,000 feet at 550 miles an hour, not so. No, it's just a little, little wooden thing. And Wilbur gets behind it and begins to push. And they're waiting for the, the wind to come along and give them a little lift, and it does. It lifts 20 feet off the ground. It flies for 12 seconds. It flies 120 feet. That's about from where I'm standing to the exit sign. Big deal. It is a big deal. It's a big deal because the Wright brothers made this assertion. All we have to do is prove that a person, one person, can fly. And if that person flies 50 or even 100 feet, 
he can fly 200. He can fly 500. He can fly 2,000. If he can fly, you can fly, we can all fly. They're just proving the general from the one particular example, and they were right. If one man can be raised from the dead unto righteous life without corruptibility, we all can. That's the good news of Easter. Amen? That's what the Apostle Paul said. Paul, Paul of course, wrote everything in the most obscure ways. It's as if he flunked um, English 102 or something. All of his sentences are hard to follow at times. But he said it this way. We testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. He, he's speaking to a group in Corinth that is skeptical. But if he didn't raise it from the dead, okay, then the dead are not raised. If the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised. Just think this through. If only for this life, then, we've been hoping in Christ. This is a pitiful situation. Stop right there before verse 20. If you're believing in Jesus raised from the dead, and it turns out to be a farce, what a pathetic thing that is. Why spend our Sunday mornings in church? Why give a tenth or more of our income? If he's dead, he's dead. But Christ indeed has been raised from the dead, and he is the first fruits. He's the first one to be raised. Because he was raised, you can be raised. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 2, he took away our fear of death. How many Christians have I known? Moments before their departure, they couldn't wait. So many times. I've told this story, but if you're visiting, you'll enjoy it. And if you're not visiting, you'll remember it with affection. Our sweet friend, our sweet friend, uh, Helen, Helen Milky. Linda, are you out there somewhere? Where are you, Linda? Linda, I sat with your mom. You remember? How old was your mom? 88. This woman was a saint. Loved her. 88. She used to sit in my office after my sermons and go over them with me. <laughs> She'd say things like, what do you mean in point two there? I'm not sure I followed that. I had so much fun with her. I used to tell her, Linda was my assistant for years. How's Linda doing? I said, well, Helen, she's out by the barn having a cigarette. <laughs> she said, oh, don't say that. The day before her death, Donna, you and I visited her. And we leaned down over her and we said, Helen, we're going out of town for a couple of days. By the time we get back, you'll probably be in glory. I don't know what more I could do for you. There's not much I could do for you. I've been praying for you. Is there anything I could do for you, Helen? And she looked at me and said, yes, get those gates to open. I don't have the button for the gate, Helen. But the Christian is looking forward to this because Christ has been raised from the dead. Amen? Amen? Consider these people. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She is on the Sabbath. It's early on the first day of the week. It's Sunday. It's in the dark, probably. I don't know what she's thinking. She's not expecting to be able to move the stone. She's just so in love with Jesus and is so concerned about his death and the proper tending to his body that she's gone there very early. And she's got someone else with her. And she finds when she gets there that the tomb is open, the stone's been rolled away. No, that wasn't so Jesus could get out. I mean, he was raised, miraculously brought back to life. It was no problem for him to go through the stones. Imagine Latin, I mean, later on he appears to his disciples as he just appeared and the doors were locked it's because he's passing through things. It's a different physical body. That stone was rolled away so they could look into it, and sure enough, they did. She looked in, and there's no body there. So she comes running down the hill and finds Simon Peter and the other disciple, that's John, the one Jesus loved. And she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. Now, how does she know that? It just never even occurred to her that maybe he's alive and was resurrected. We don't even know where they have put him. Well, the guys hear that, and they don't know what to think. His body's not there. The stone was rolled away. What are these women saying to us? So they run towards the tomb. Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. The other disciple outran Peter. So he was in better shape, apparently. And he reached the tomb first. But Peter's the older man, and so the other disciple defers to him. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. And then Peter who was behind him, arrived. And he went into the tomb. And he saw the strips of linen lying there. This is a very peculiar thing. And the burial cloth, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. What? Well, think about this, friends. The, the language there, the construction of those sentences suggests 
where it says they were separated one from the other, what it really invites us to picture is this. There's a long cloth about the length of a man's body lying there neatly, and there's a blink of separation, maybe four or five inches, is another cloth. Well, that's exactly the way a corpse laid out would look, with the long burial cloth on it, and then the other piece folded around the head. But now there they are. If you ever saw the Passion movie, that, they do that scene very well, where suddenly you see the cloth and it just goes like this, there's no body under it. It's perfectly done. And they're looking at it, and what are they thinking? It's very uh, strange. Well, who would steal a body and take the time to unwrap it? A broken, mangled, sweaty, bloody body. And we take the time to unwrap it, set the cloth down politely and carefully, and then carry the body out? Who would do that? Something is odd about this. And it says, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, this is John, went inside. He said he saw and believed. We talked about this the other day at our elders meeting and in the staff chapel time. What did he believe? He saw and believed. He believed what? Well, they certainly, be, they, they had found the women's testimony to be incredulous. What do you mean the body's gone? Somebody took the body, but he looks and sees no body. At least he believed, well, they're right. The body's gone. But it's just like the word of God to do something like this. I think what John is doing here is giving us a double meaning. He believed. He now believed the women. And he also believed. Then it says parenthetically, they still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. He had to validate his ministry. He had to suffer for our sins. His defeat of death is the defeat of death on our behalf. Of course a resurrection was essential, unless he's a farce, a charlatan, and a faker. Now the men leave, and they jog back towards town. They don't know what to think. And they, apparently they left the women there. And Jesus appears to Mary. Do you remember when Jesus said, I know my sheep, I call them by name? Well, he does. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? She thinks he's the gardener. It's Jesus. Thinking he's the gardener, she said, Sir, if you carry him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. It's a very bold statement, isn't it? Here's this one woman, maybe another woman with her, and he's, he's a, a full-grown male, and they're going to go get him wherever he is. But Jesus turns to her, and he said, Mary, as soon as he said her name, she knew who it was. You know that? When, when you step ultimately into the presence of Christ, he will say your name. Linda, if this is your last day or if it's mine, Linda, say Linda. He knows. He knows that. Pam, come Pam, come by me, he'll say. So she clings to him. She's hugging him now. And he says this enigmatic thing here. He says, do not hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the Father. Not quite sure what that means. I have a theory. It's strictly mine, which means it's probably not valid, but that maybe he goes to the Father and he comes back. I don't know. There's a period in between. I once taught that in the class. And somebody says, so you're saying Jesus was commuting between these events? I don't know, but he's been raised from the dead, and he says, don't hold on to me yet. I have to return to the Father. Go ahead instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my Father and your, your Father, to my God and your God. And someone said, what are you talking about? I thought he was God. He's God and man. That's the man speaking. Jesus Christ. It's from the great gathering where the Pope, Pope Leo, wrote in his tome that Jesus Christ can only be understood as fully man and fully God. That's the man, the sinless man speaking, my God and your God. He had said earlier, in a little while, you'll see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. I don't know. That sort of points to a little back and forth. You won't see me. You will see me. But here's the point. This is all just fiction unless there's some internal proof. I've shared this so many times over the years, and I learned it from somebody smarter than I. Proof of the resurrection lies right in what the text itself says. Those men were terrified. Now the word is out all around Jerusalem that the body is missing. You can bet Pilate wants nothing to do with this problem. And the temple priests are just as unhappy. They want to know who took the body. They're looking everywhere for the body. They're inquiring. They're paying off the guards who said they were asleep when the body was taken, which is quite bizarre. How do you know it was taken when you were asleep? So they're hiding. It says they're hiding. They're frightened on that first evening, that, on the evening of that first day of the week. 
When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, that's not anti-Semitic, these guys are all Jews. They're afraid of their Jewish friends. They're hiding. The doors are locked. Jesus came and stood among them. So he just passed through the doors. Great. He said, peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his side. And you remember the rest. Now, what would take a group of men hiding, hoping that no one can find them, and thinking about where to relocate and fast so they don't get scooped up and put in jail and maybe crucified? What would, take, what would prompt them to go out into the streets and talk about having seen the risen Christ? They'd be crazy to do that unless what? Unless they saw him. And so if you read ahead just seven or eight or nine, ten days later in the book of Acts, you find that these same men are out there preaching Christ risen. And the authorities said, we gave you strict orders not to do this, not to teach in his name. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. You're determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And Peter said, and the others said, we have to do it. We must obey God rather than men. Like, how could we not do this? We saw him. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed for hanging him on a tree. This went over great. It got them beaten, nearly beaten to death. Why would they do this? And it leaves us, again, dealing with the great question that Pilate asked. He asked a lot of questions before the crucifixion. He had questions for the priests, questions for the people, questions for the citizens. He had questions for Jesus. And finally he comes out and he says to them, Okay, what shall I do then with Jesus? who is called the Christ. Here's my question for you. With respect, what are you going to do about Jesus? If you've been born again, been born of the Spirit, then you're all set. You know just what I'm driving at. But if you haven't been, understand this, please. I say it with kindness. If you ignore Jesus, you just denied him. There's no in-between. What do you want to do about Jesus? What shall I do with him? Forty years ago, plus a few weeks, I invited him and asked him into my life. And my sweet wife did the same thing a couple weeks later. What do you want to do about Jesus? What would be said about you if you only have one day to live? How do you know when that day is? Oh, if this sounds like evangelism by threat, that's just what it is. We do need to be confronted with this truth. You have one day to live. Do you want a glass of wine and a cigarette with it, or do you want to contend with heaven over what comes next? A dear old fellow I knew for lots of years, I used to play nine holes of golf with now and again. I think he's long gone now. But some years ago, I saw him and we walked nine holes of golf. He was a sweet old guy. But he knew what I did. And I never got a chance to witness him. So his name was Ed. And I said, Ed, listen, as long as we're walking along, you know what I do. He said, yeah, I know. I said, can I talk to you? How old are you? He said, I'm 85. I said, well, look, you know, 85. Pretty close. Right? That's right. All right, 85. If you're not going to deal with the question by the time you're 85, when are you going to deal with it? Is that fair? He said, uh, I'm 85. I said, may I ask you something? Yeah, go ahead. I said, what are you thinking about eternity in that moment when the lights go out and you step over? He said, I have absolutely no interest in that and I do not want to discuss it. I didn't beg him to listen. He's free to do that. He's a free moral agent, the philosopher would say. I don't want to talk about it, he said. What I said was just for Pilate. So what do you want to do about Christ? Nothing. It's a scary time as we move towards the end. If they tell you you have one day left, what are you going to do about it? That's the first question. What do you want to do with your one day left? And number two, what do you want to do about Christ? And one last question, based on a story that's quite amazing. Yesterday was April 15th. We all know what April 15th is about, right? Trying to figure out those forms. Right? Nobody I know understands those forms. Nobody does. This is not a political statement, but I can't understand why anybody wants President Trump's tax forms. I can't understand my tax forms. And they're only six pages. His is 6,000 pages. Who would read that? You must be bored if you want to read that. But it was tax day. But you know, long before it was tax day, April 15th was famous for something else. It was April 15th, 1912, when the Titanic went down up in the North Sea, in the frigid waters. Lots of people died that day. There was a man on that ship named John Harper. 
he was an evangelist, he was a preacher, and he was apparently a delightful man that everybody liked, and he spent his five or six days on the cruise going about meeting people, looking for a chance to tell them the good news about Jesus. When the ship hit the iceberg and it became obvious it wasn't going to last, he came across a man he had spoken with earlier who was quite anxious because he didn't have a, you know, a jacket to wear, a life jacket. I don't know why they ran out of, they ran out of everything. And so Harper gave him his, of course. A little while later, everybody's in the ocean that wasn't in a boat. That man survived, and that man told a story. He said, I was bobbing up and down, and there I looked, and there was John Harper holding onto a brief, small piece of wood, clinging to it. And he recognized me, and he came over by me. They're in the freezing cold ocean in the North Atlantic. And, the man, and he said to me, are you saved or not? And he said, I didn't know what to say. I, I don't know, I don't know. And he said, down went Harper. He said, and I, I was watching, and he came back up, still clinging. He said, are you saved? You can be saved, you know. Come to the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. And down he went again. He didn't come back up. Well, that man, whose name I couldn't locate, tells that story of how either then or the next day he gave his life to Christ. You know, it's really very interesting, though, that the White Star Line out of Liverpool owned the Titanic and its sister ships. And now you're in 1912, so over a century ago, they don't have any internet, and nobody can tweet or text. Everything is being published on paper. And for many weeks after the sinking of the Titanic in their big windows, they posted these lists of people who were saved and lost. And on the lost list in their window was that name, John Harper. On the saved list was the name of the guy to whom he had been a witness. But here's my question. You realize, right, that in heaven there's another list of saved and lost. And on the saved list in heaven is the name John Harper. Now the first question was, if you're going to live one day, what do you want to do with it? The second question was Pilate's question. What do you want to do about Christ? And the third question is this. Which list are you on? Saved or lost? Pray with me, please. There may be someone here this morning who wants to finally and fully be saved and get off the lost list. If that's the case with anyone here, you need not stand up, come forward, raise your hand, nothing like that. All eyes are closed, including mine. This would be a great time to say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Save me. I receive what the Bible tells me, that you were raised from the dead for my sake. I want to be part of that. Jesus, save me. What a joy, Lord Jesus, to contemplate that even as he was departing, this brother in the Lord was sharing the good news. What a joy to be reminded that whatever day we're in, it should be a day of contemplating your goodness and the cross. As we sing and close our worship time, we pray that you are blessed, Lord Jesus, and we pray in your name. Amen.